Okay. Uh, colleagues, uh, welcome back uh, to our second Frith Prize lecturer to the, of the conference. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Jennifer Murphy. Now, the nomination for Jennifer referred to her as, quote, the most promising young scientist I have ever seen. I know this is sort of embarrassing here, <laughs> but that's actually what it said. And I understand the sentiment because when Jenny applied for a job in my own department at Royal Holloway, I remember looking at her CV and thinking that there must be a mistake because no PhD student could produce the volume and quality of work that she had. And it turned out that there was no mistake and we were absolutely delighted to attract her. Jenny's thesis contributed substantially to our understanding of interoception or the perception of the body's internal state and its relationship to the development of clinical conditions, particularly in adolescence. And in addition to these theoretical contributions, the nomination talked about Jenny's development of innovative ways to measure interoceptive phenomena and the fact that these measures are already being applied in labs around the world. So we're really delighted to hear what you've got in store for us today, Jenny. Um, and the title of the talk will be Interoceptive Ability, Measurement, Conceptualization, and Individual Differences. So thanks very much, Jenny. Thank you. So uh, yeah, thank you, Kathy, for that lovely introduction. I'm suitably embarrassed. <laughs> so uh, yes, my name is Jenny, and I'm really, really pleased to be here today to talk to you about some of the work that I did during my PhD looking at interception. So is this going to move on? Let's find out. Yes. So today's talk, I'm going to cover really, very really quickly the background context on interception to get you all up to speed so that we all know what we're talking about. And then I'll move on to talk about my work that has focused on interception across development, links between interception and emotional ability before focusing on the measurement of interception and also the structure of interceptive abilities. So perhaps it's important that we first begin by thinking about what even is interception? Well, interception is defined as the perception of the internal state of one's body. And this includes sensations like feeling your heart beating, your breathing, or simply knowing when you need to go to the toilet. And whilst that seems like quite a simple definition, actually this definition hides a lot of ambiguity regarding what is and what isn't an internal signal. So whilst these kind of early definitions of interception were quite restrictive to only signals that really kind of obviously met the criteria to be considered internal, something like feeling your heart beating might be an example of this, more contemporary definitions acknowledge that there's this kind of fuzzy boundary between interception and extraception and therefore extend inclusion to signals that may not readily meet the criteria to be considered internal but which follow common neural pathways to interceptive regions in the brain. And it's this more contemporary definition of interception that I'm going to be using today. Before we consider sort of my work on interception, I want to begin by thinking, why should we even care about interception? Well, firstly, I'm going to try and convince you that people really do care about this. So this is quite a nice graph that shows uh, sort of articles referencing interception or measuring interceptive aspects without kind of referring to interception specifically from when the term was introduced in around 1905 until around 2015. And what we can see is there's kind of an uptick in interest from around the 1980s onwards from when a kind of measurement of interception started uh, to gain a little bit more focus. But from around 2015, which is also when I started my PhD, there was this massive uptick of interest in interception. And clearly I jumped on the bandwagon with this one. So, why is it that everyone was so interested in interception? Well, I would argue that firstly, it's due to the observation that interception may be important for various aspects of our physical health. So if we think about interception more obviously, 
Perhaps interoception is likely to be playing a role in the regulation of homeostasis, prompting you to grab a drink when you feel thirsty. But I would argue that most interest in interoception from around 2010, 2015 onwards was driven by the observation that interoception may be fundamentally important for various aspects of higher order cognition, our emotional abilities, our social abilities, and even things like our decision-making ability. In fact, interoception has been associated with a wide variety of fundamental higher order cognitive processes. And perhaps unsurprisingly, given the number of different aspects with which interoception has been associated, perhaps it's unsurprising that interoception has also been associated with a number of mental health conditions. Indeed, various different mental health conditions have been associated with kind of atypicalities in interoceptive processing. And so it's kind of observations such as this that I would argue have driven this kind of increased interest in interoception. So hopefully I've kind of convinced you that we should care about interoception. So when I started my PhD, there was kind of this one predominant model that uh, was characterizing kind of individual differences in interoception and separating individual differences in interoception into three main facets. The first being interoceptive accuracy, so this being performance on behavioural tests of interoception, where we invite someone into the lab, we measure some aspect of their physiology, we take an estimate from the participant, and we can compare the participant's estimate to the objective measure to kind of determine accuracy. The second facet being this aspect called interoceptive sensibility, which really refers to one's engagement by interoceptive signals, typically measured by a self-report. And this kind of final facet of interoception, termed interoceptive awareness, that's really this kind of metacognitive component reflecting the correspondence between interoceptive accuracy and interoceptive sensibility. But despite the fact that there are these kind of three main facets of interoception, unsurprisingly, ooh, too quick, really it's been the measurement of accuracy that had uh, been given the most focus in the literature. And there's some things that are worth bearing in mind about the measurement of interoceptive accuracy. Firstly, it's that interoceptive accuracy is not a unitary ability. So just because you're really, really good at perceiving cardiac signals doesn't mean you're going to be any good at perceiving respiratory signals. So interoceptive accuracy doesn't seem to be this kind of domain general unitary ability. The second aspect that's worth bearing in mind is that the majority of research to date has focused on the perception of cardiac signals. And there is one task that has been used predominantly in the literature, and this is known as the heartbeat counting task. And in this task, participants are simply asked to count their heartbeats over a series of intervals whilst uh, their heartbeat is objectively recorded, and then the objective measurement is compared to the subjective <coughs> estimate to determine its accuracy. So whilst this task is really popular, it's really simple to administer, and it doesn't take a lot of time, in fact, there were some problems with the measurement of interoceptive accuracy using this task. At least when I started my PhD, there were concerns regarding a number of confounds, both physiological and also psychological. In terms of physiology, this is things like heart rate variability, resting heart rate, blood pressure, body mass index, all appeared to be associated with performance on the heartbeat counting task. But perhaps more problematically, problematically was the observation uh, that participants' beliefs regarding their own or the average resting heart rate seemed to be related to performance on this task, such that if you had better accuracy of your knowledge regarding the average resting heart rate or your own resting heart rate, you could do well on this task simply by guessing rather than actually perceiving individual heartbeats. So, that's
that's kind of the speedy background context to get you up to speed, but I'll come back throughout the talk to some of these aspects just as a reminder. So my work on interception, as I was saying earlier, has focused on the development and etiology of individual differences in interception, measurement, links with emotion, and also considered the structure of interceptive ability. And I'm going to kick off by telling you a little bit about some work that I did looking at interception across development and also links between interception and emotional ability. So the first thing that we did was look at interception in childhood, and we did this using historic data that had been collected kind of about 15 years previously in the twins' early development study. And what we were interested in was both stability and change in interceptive ability. So what did we observe? Well, firstly, we did find age-related change in interceptive accuracy. So relative performance on the heartbeat counting task did appear to increase from the age of 8 to the age of 10. So performance on the heartbeat counting task, at least in terms of an aggregate, seemed to increase with age. But perhaps surprisingly, stability was actually quite low. So rank order of participants did seem to change across uh, the two different time points at which heartbeat counting performance was assessed. Now, as I mentioned, this was a uh, twin study, and because of this, this meant that we could separate the kind of contribution of genetic factors, shared environmental factors, and non-shared environmental factors. So A denoted genetic factors, C here, uh, shared environmental factors, and E here, non-shared environmental factors. And perhaps surprisingly, we found that these kind of non-shared environmental factors, these are aspects that make individuals within the same family different from one another, seem to be contributing the most variance to both stability of interception and also change in performance on the heartbeat counting task. But perhaps the thing that surprised us the most about these data was we found none of the expected relationships with mental health or emotion recognition ability in this cohort, both at the age of 10 or at the age of 8. So, okay, we then moved on to consider interception at a different developmental stage and considered interception uh, across the ages of 18 to 90 years of age. So firstly, we looked at self-reported engagement by internal signals, and what we observed was that uh, with advancing age, there seemed to be a decrease in self-reported interceptive engagement uh, by these kind of interceptive signals. And interestingly, in another cohort that we looked at of around 140 individuals of the same ages, again here what we found was that age was associated with a decline in performance on the heartbeat counting task. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of kind of physiological and psychological confounds associated with this task. And so what we were interested in is whether any of these age-related changes that we were seeing in terms of performance on the heartbeat counting task would be explained by any of these factors. And whilst we found that one factor did account for a small amount of variance, we did still find that there seemed to be an association between age and decline in performance on this heartbeat counting task. But of course, really, the big aim here was to consider the relationship between interception and emotional ability. And so what we wanted to examine was whether age-related change in interceptive ability, so interceptive accuracy, may be contributing at all to the age-related changes that we see in emotion recognition ability with advancing age. And so we did this using a psychophysical task where we morphed both identity and expressions of anger and disgust. And what that allowed us is to have a kind of measure of identity recognition and also a measure of emotion recognition ability. And we compared this to performance on the heartbeat counting task. Now, we did find a small relationship between emotion recognition ability and interceptive accuracy in the expected direction, such that emotion recognition ability uh, seemed to be associated with better performance on the heartbeat counting task. And this was not observed for our identity control task. However, 
This was not observed after we'd controlled for those other physiological and psychological compounds that I mentioned earlier. We were also very interested in whether interceptive accuracy would actually be accounting for any particular variance above kind of previously identified factors that had been associated with age-related changes in emotion recognition ability. Things like IQ, for example, or processing speed. And what we observed was that interceptive accuracy didn't really explain any of these age-related changes in emotion recognition ability after we'd accounted for these other factors. So these findings were quite surprising, and pretty much this relationship between um, interceptive accuracy and emotion recognition ability, the fact that we weren't observing this relationship got us thinking. And in particular, this got us thinking a little bit more about the measurement of interceptive accuracy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the heartbeat counting task had been associated with a number of physiological and psychological compounds. And this kind of led us towards the possibility that Perhaps our measurement of interceptive accuracy isn't good enough. And around this time, there were a number of kind of surprising relationships coming out in the literature. One of these in particular was this relationship between performance on the heartbeat counting task and intelligence, IQ. So whilst we observed this relationship between interceptive accuracy and IQ in a first study of around 100 individuals, in a second study of around 120 individuals, what we observed was that this association was fully explained by the accuracy of participants' beliefs regarding the average resting heart rate, such that individuals who had higher IQ had greater accuracy of beliefs regarding the average resting heart rate, and this in turn related to better performance on the heartbeat counting task. In terms of uh, going back to emotion, recall that we didn't find a kind of reliable association between the heartbeat counting task and emotion recognition ability in our sample of older adults or children. And this was kind of surprising given the theoretical and empirical work that would suggest a relationship between the two. And so in a number of following studies, we wanted to examine the relationship between interceptive ability and emotional abilities in a little bit more detail. And we did this by focusing on a subclinical condition called alexithymia. So alexithymia, as I mentioned earlier, is a subclinical condition which is characterized by difficulties identifying and describing one's own emotions, as well as a kind of externally orientated thinking style. Now, alexithymia has been associated with difficulties with interception, at least while when assessed by self-report. So individuals with alexithymia do seem to be reporting difficulties with perceiving internal states. However, this doesn't seem to be coming through in the literature, and most of the literature had been quite mixed and had relied on the heartbeat counting task. So what we wanted to do was examine the relationship between alexithymia and heartbeat counting performance, but also consider these physiological and psychological confounds that I had mentioned earlier. So when we examined the relationship between alexithymia and heartbeat counting performance in a sample of around 250 individuals, we found no association between the two. But after we controlled for these other factors, in addition to factors like anxiety and depression that had been associated both with heartbeat counting performance and also been associated with alexithymia, we found that there was a small negative relationship between alexithymia and performance on these tasks. However, these associations are still quite difficult to interpret, you know, the need to uh, control for all of these different factors when using this task. And really what the bottom line was, the field needed better tests and better ways of measuring interceptive accuracy.
So just a reminder, interoceptive accuracy is not a unitary ability. Just because you're good at perceiving internal signals in one domain doesn't mean you'll be any good at perceiving signals in other domains. And as such, we need cross-domain tests to really assess individual differences in interoceptive accuracy. And so as the next stage of my PhD sought to kind of develop novel measures of interoceptive ability across different domains of interoception. So the first task that I developed uh, focused on one's propensity to use internal signals in the respiratory domain. So what we did in this task is we manipulated participants' access to internal versus external cues, so the external cues associated with their exhalation, these kind of auditory signals associated with their exhalation, and also in one condition they only had access to internal cues and in the other condition they had access to these external cues. In both conditions, what participants did is they performed a standard exhalation into a peak flow meter. After that, we gave them an aim, 30, 50, 70 or 90% of the exhalation that they had just completed. And then we asked them to perform a second exhalation, trying to get to the aim that we'd given them. And after they'd done this, we asked them to estimate how close they'd thought they'd got to. And this was our measure here sort of how close they thought they'd got to the target and then how close that they'd actually got to the target. And what we did is we took a different score where external cues were available to them versus when external cues were not available to them. And what we observed in terms of the relationship with alexithymia was that alexithymia was associated with this kind of increasing reliance on external cues for gauging this respiratory output, therefore suggesting that individuals with alexithymia benefit from having access to these external cues, whereas individuals who don't have as high rates of alexithymia appear to rely kind of much more on these internal cues when gauging their respiratory output. In terms of the second and third study, what we did is we looked at the relationship between interoceptive accuracy in the uh, domain of muscular effort and also taste and alexithymia. In the domain of muscular effort in study two, we did this using a matching task and in study three, in the domain of taste sensitivity, we did this using a psychophysical design. And what we observed in both of these studies was this negative association between alexithymia and interoceptive accuracy, such that increasing um, rates of alexithymia in individuals was associated with poor performance in both of these tasks. And we observed this in the taste perception task, even after we'd controlled for these factors like depression and anxiety that are potential confounds. Now, more recently, I've gone back to cardiac interoception and focused on developing another way of measuring interoceptive accuracy in this domain. So I didn't lie to you earlier when I said that the most commonly used task is the heartbeat counting task, and that is true, but I didn't tell you that there is another task that is quite commonly used in the literature, and this is known as the heartbeat detection or heartbeat discrimination task. And in this task, participants are presented with a tone or a flash that is either in or out of sync with their heartbeat. And what the participant's task is, is to tell the experimenter whether the signal appeared to be in sync with their heartbeat or not in sync with their heartbeat. Now, there are various different versions of this task, and kind of the most popular one is the two alternative false choice task. And what this task does is it has predetermined intervals for synchronous and asynchronous. So typically around 200 to 250 milliseconds is perceived to be synchronous. And so it is predetermined that if you answer this for synchronous, you've got this correct. And in terms of asynchronous, it's around 550 milliseconds. Now, whilst this is quite a simple task to administer, Evidence from these kind of other versions of these tasks, this multi-level task known as the method of constant stimuli or the methods of adjustment, 
kind of highlight a potential issue with the two alternative false choice tasks. So whilst on average the evidence from these multi-level tasks suggests that on average people perceive an interval between 200 and to 300 milliseconds following the heartbeat as synchronous with their heartbeat. In fact, there are large individual differences in the delay at which an individual perceives a signal to be synchronous with their heartbeat. And that's a little bit of a problem. So to give you an example, say I perceive two, uh, 400 milliseconds to be synchronous with my heartbeat. What do I do on the two alternative voice choice task? Both are equidistant from the interval that I perceive to be synchronous with my heartbeat. Both 250 milliseconds delays feels out of sync, but also 550 milliseconds delay feels out of sync. So what would happen potentially on this task is that I would respond randomly and I would be classed as non-interceptive when in fact I am interceptive, I just prefer a different delay. So whilst these multi-level tasks get around this problem of these slight, you know, these fairly large individual differences in what feels to be synchronous, um, they are quite lengthy to administer, making them quite onerous for participants, and they're also very difficult to deploy at scale. So what we were aiming to do uh, when developing a novel task of interceptive accuracy in the cardiac domain was to get around this potential problem of these individual differences and in the delay at which an individual perceives an external stimulus like a tone or a flash to be synchronous with their heartbeat, but also make sure that these tasks weren't too onerous to, uh, for participants and too difficult to deploy at scale. So we looked at developing this new task which we call the phase adjustment task. This novel task is much quicker to administer than these other tasks and what participants are asked to do is they are presented with a series of tones that are presented initially out of phase with the heartbeat. Now after listening to these tones for a little while, what participants are asked to do is to adjust the virtual dial to change the phase relationship between the tones until they appear to be synchronous with the heartbeat. And because the starting phase is completely random across trials, uh, the consistency of the preferred delay selected can be used to infer accuracy. So if I'm consistently selecting kind of 400 milliseconds as feeling kind of in sync with my heartbeat, then this would suggest that I am actually perceiving heartbeats and thus I, am, um, I do have heartbeat perception. Whereas if across trials I'm just randomly putting different numbers, I would have low consistency and therefore we would infer that this participant would not be intra, uh, have interceptive accuracy in this domain. So we piloted uh, this study in a sample of around 120 participants and what you can see on the graph here, if you can see it uh, hopefully well enough, um, though I can't on my own screen, um, but hopefully you can see here that uh, the red line uh, demonstrates kind of a simulated random distribution of consistency scores and the black line that you can see here is the participants real data. So on the x-axis what you can see is the consistency scores. Now Reassuringly, what we observed is that some participants are non-random on this task and it seems to be about a third of participants that have consistency scores which are sort of significantly, significantly above uh, chance. And this is reassuring because that's around about the number of participants that seem to be interceptive on these kind of method of constant stimuli or method of adjustment tasks. But what's quite exciting about this task is not only does this overcome the issue of time, with this task typically taking about half the time of these other multi-level tasks, it's also the fact that this task can be administered at scale via a smartphone application. And this opens up avenues for engaging more participants with research and also allowing uh, samples to be collected at scale, which kind of overcomes these issues in the field with kind of small sample sizes. Okay. 
So hopefully I've got you up to speed with some of the work that I've been doing on the measurement of interoceptive accuracy. But I'd like to switch focus now and focus on the measurement of self-reported interoceptive abilities. So I'm going to take you back to thinking about the structure of interoceptive abilities. Just to give you a reminder that there were three dimensions, three facets of interoception that had been highlighted in this kind of most popular model of interoception when I started my PhD. And this was separating interoceptive accuracy. We should kind of know what this is now. So this is performance on these objective tests of interoception, heartbeat counting, heartbeat detection, the phase adjustment task that I've been telling you about already. Self-reported engagement by internal signals, this facet of interoceptive sensibility, and this final aspect of interoceptive awareness, this kind of metacognitive component reflecting the correspondence between the two. Now, if we focus in on this model in a little bit more detail, what you can see is this model is separating aspects of interoception based on how interoception is measured, whether interoception is assessed via a self-report measure or whether interoception is assessed by a behavioural test. And this makes sense, because in the literature, it doesn't appear there's a huge amount of correspondence between the two. So typically, self-report measures of interoception don't neatly map on to objective performance. But thinking about this aspect of interoceptive sensibility in a bit more detail... Whilst typically assessed using questionnaire measures, interoceptive sensibility is really this kind of umbrella term. And whilst it includes measures of self-reported engagement by internal signals, in these models it also included things like confidence ratings collected during a task of interoceptive accuracy as well as self-reported questionnaire measures of various different aspects of kind of bodily awareness. And in fact, there wasn't a huge amount of relationship between these kind of questionnaire measures and confidence ratings, and also between all these different questionnaire measures. So this kind of raised the possibility that perhaps self-reported interoception is not a unitary ability. And so this kind of observation that self-reported interoception may not be unitary led towards the development of a new model of interoceptive abilities that I proposed during my PhD. So whilst this model, like the previous model that I was showing you earlier, does separate interoceptive individual differences in interoception based on how interoception is measured via behavioural tasks or via self-report, it also considers what aspect of interoception is assessed by any self-report measure. And in this model, we're distinguishing between the accuracy with which an individual perceives internal states or believes they can perceive internal states and one's attention to internal signals. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work that I did during my PhD looking at testing one aspect of this model by looking at the relationship between these different self-report measures. So testing this model was actually fairly difficult because there weren't a huge amount of pure measures of self-reported interoceptive accuracy. So I had to make one. So I came in during my PhD, I created this interoceptive accuracy scale and this uh, development of this, of course, involved looking at the psychometric properties of the measure, test-free, test reliability, and that sort of thing. But basically, this questionnaire measure asked participants to rate how accurately they believe that they can perceive a number of different internal sensations. So it includes items such as, I can always accurately perceive when my heart is beating fast, my breathing, blood glucose, blah, 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 blah. And we compared this to an existing questionnaire measure of self-reported interoceptive accuracy, the Interoceptive Confusion Questionnaire, which again includes sensation... Uh, items such as I'm very sensitive to changes in my heart rate. And it's worth mentioning that this is a, a confusion questionnaire, so a high score on the interoceptive confusion questionnaire denotes sort of higher difficulties, so lower self-reported accuracy of perceiving internal signals. 
And we compared this to the most popular measure of self-reported interoception, which is the body perception questionnaire. And this includes items such as, during most situations, I'm aware of how hard my heart is beating. Now, in terms of the prediction of the new model of interoceptive abilities that I proposed, what we should expect to find is an association between the different self-report measures of interoceptive accuracy. However, these should not be associated with the self-report measure of interoceptive attention. If we found a relationship between all of this dif these different measures, this would support the earlier model that grouped all self-report measures under this umbrella term of interoceptive sensibility. So what did we observe? Well, we did find that self-report measures of interoceptive accuracy were correlated with each other. This is a negative relationship, remember, because one measure is self-reported interoceptive accuracy and the other is self-reported interoceptive confusion. In terms of the relationship between self-reported accuracy and attention, we found no association between the self-report measures of interoceptive accuracy and the self-report measures of interoceptive attention, thereby supporting this proposal that we need to not only distinguish based on how interoception is measured, but also consider what aspect of interoception was assessed by any of these measures. And this was particularly important at the time, given that we were seeing different results in the literature reported across different studies, and results were particularly mixed. And this may be because we were thinking of self-reported interoception as a kind of unitary ability. And in fact, the pattern that we see across different conditions is unique. So for example, if we go back to alexithymia, whilst yes, alexithymia does seem to be associated with lower self-reported interoceptive accuracy, in fact, there doesn't seem to be any relationship between alexithymia and self-reported interoceptive attention. So self-reported interoception is not a unitary ability, and if we want to understand individual differences in interoception, we need to consider not only how interoception is measured, but also what is being assessed by any of our measures. More recently, I've gone back to this um, to sort of address a potentially killjoy explanation for the results that were observed. So, yes, of course, there is one possibility that there is this dissociation between interoceptive accuracy and interoceptive attention, but there are also kind of different sensations rated across these different questionnaires. So, of course, given the observation that uh, interoceptive accuracy, at least as assessed behaviourally, uh, may dissociate across different domains, the fact that these different questionnaires are assessing different uh, sort of sensations may be somewhat problematic. And so what I did was develop a new scale, the interoceptive attention scale, that was exactly matched for the sensations with the interoceptive accuracy scale, but which, where one is focusing on measuring self-reported attention to internal signals, and the other is assessing self-reported accuracy of perceiving internal signals. And what we should expect to find if my model's prediction of this dissociation between self-reported accuracy and self-reported attention is correct is no association between the two scales, even though they're assessing the same internal sensations. As well as this, I was very interested in the interpretation of participants of this slightly vague term in the body perception questionnaire of awareness and whether individual differences in the interpretation of this term may be altering associations that were reported in the literature. So, we're looking to see whether we still find associations when we have matched questionnaires for the sensations rated, but also looking to see whether the interpretation of the term awareness matters. So what did we find? 
Well, we found that uh, questionnaires that assessed the same facet of interoception were associated with each other. So you can see in the top left-hand corner, I've got the self-report measures of interoceptive accuracy. One is accuracy, one is confusion, hence the negative relationship. Um, but these were correlated with each other. Bottom left hand, you've got the relationship between the self-report measures of interoceptive attention. And again, we find the association between the two. But we found no association between questionnaire measures that were assessing different facets of interoception, replicating the previous studies that I had told you about earlier. But I'm going to draw your attention to this one in particular, which is this lack of an association between the attention scale and the accuracy scale even when they were exactly matched for the sensations that were rated. So it doesn't seem that this dissociation between self-reported accuracy and self-reported interoceptive attention is due to any differences in the sensations rated across the different questionnaires. In terms of the interpretation of the questionnaires, Reassuringly, most participants did interpret the term at the attention questionnaire as assessing attention, and most participants interpreted the accuracy questionnaire as assessing accuracy. But in terms of the interpretation of this term awareness for the body perception questionnaire, there really was no consensus. Some participants interpret this interpreted this as assessing attention, some accuracy, and some the frequency with which these sensations occurred within the body. And so what we wanted to see is whether this would alter any associations that we saw between the other questionnaires. And perhaps expectingly, uh, as expected, in the subsample that uh, interpreted the BPQ term awareness as assessing attention, we found a relationship between the BPQ and the self-report measure of interoceptive attention. So when people think the measure is assessing attention, then it correlates with other self-report measures of attention, but not with self-report measures of accuracy. In contrast, in the subsample who interpreted this term awareness as assessing accuracy, we found this kind of small relationship between this questionnaire measure and, this, uh, and other self-report measures of interoceptive accuracy and no relationship between the self-report measures of uh, attention. And so what it appears is that the way that participants interpret this term awareness does seem to be uh, altering the associations that we see between this questionnaire and um, other measures, which is somewhat important for understanding the kind of mixed results that we'd seen in the field where this questionnaire had been used across different conditions and across different groups where there may have been differences in the way that this questionnaire had been interpreted. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of the work that I've been doing during my PhD, but I'd like to tell you a little bit now very quickly about some of the future directions that I hope to be taking. So whilst I'll hopefully consider, can uh, still do some work looking at measurement and links for the motion and the structure of interoceptive abilities, I'm very interested in the, at the moment in the sex differences that we see in interoceptive accuracy. So a recent meta-analysis that I did uh, with a student, Frey Apprentice, observed perhaps an unintuitive uh, pattern of results across uh, different sexes. So what we observed was that it, across a range of different tasks, so both the heartbeat counting task, the detection task that I told you about earlier, various other cardiac tasks, and also respiratory-based tasks, it appeared that women have lower interoceptive accuracy than men. And so my work at the moment is seeking to understand what is the cause of these differences that we see in interoceptive accuracy and what are the implications of these differences both for understanding differences that we see in mental health but also understanding differences that there may be in emotional abilities and also the way that emotions are processed. So in summary, to give you an overview, interoception really is a gross area for research. 
If I just remind you about that slide that I showed you at the very beginning, yes, people are very interested in this area, but it's really been plagued by issues with measurement. And yeah, most of my research has gone around highlighting problems, but more recently I have been working towards solutions to some of these problems. Because I do think that better measurement of interception will allow us to better test these theoretical models and truly understand whether interception is important or perhaps not for health and aspects of higher order cognition. So I'd like to uh, finish off by uh, thanking all of the collaborators that were involved uh, during my PhD. Unfortunately, there's too many people to mention. And a special thanks to everyone who was in the bird lab when I did my PhD. Of course, a massive thank you to the EPS for this award. And of course, a big thanks to all of you for listening. Well, that was another sensational talk. And the thing. I hope this isn't a stupid question. Um, but you said this you were talking about this idea that people who might be good at perceiving one type of interceptive signal, but not another. Mm. What, why is that? And how do you think that influences um, the types of measurement tools that you've created? Mm, it's a good question. I don't think um, that. I guess it's, there's a number of different kind of uh, physiological uh, signals that form the basis of these different signals. So, you know, just because you're good at perceiving cardiac signals doesn't mean that you're good at perceiving respiratory signals, as I said earlier. And it may be because some of these rely on different neural pathways, for example. It may be that the way that we set up these tasks are not well matched. So it may be that some of the tasks... Um, have different kind of uh, demands on attention, for example. And I don't think that anyone has kind of really narrowed in on well matching all of these tasks across different domains to really sort of narrow in and make sure that the reason that we don't find it, that we find these dissociations isn't simply because you know some of these tasks have different demands than than others. But I would say that even the kind of older data that has tried to kind of very well um, match tasks across different domains hasn't always found uh, relationships between the two. If there is a relationship, I, I guess that it seems to be quite small. Uh, one of the exceptions to the rule of this, though, that is probably worth mentioning is that uh, there does seem to be a relationship between the perception of cardiac and gastric signals. That has been reported in the literature. Um, but again, that does seem to be, depend, kind of the magnitude of this association depends on kind of how well the tasks are matched to each other. So I would say that um, probably the jury's still out on that. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, again, I don't think that we've actually narrowed in on good enough tasks across all of these different domains of interception that there are to kind of conclusively say that there is clustering and people who are good at perceiving one signal are going to be good at perceiving another or bad and vice versa. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a, a great answer to that purely on the basis that um, there aren't really enough well-matched tasks in the literature at the moment um, to assess that properly. Was there another one at the back? Did you say you were in Jeff Bird's lab? I, I, yes. I think Dad said that about the scribe paper. It wouldn't be the first time I'd describe the paper and find out the person giving the talk who wrote the paper. <laughs> <laughs> There was a paper that came from Jeff Burst that I read that I really liked where they were looking at the, or maybe you were looking at the association between um, a diagnosis of autism and levels of alexithymia or a diagnosis of alexithymia and the ability to uh, self monitor levels of arousal in response to IAPS images. Yes, yeah, that wasn't mine, that but I know it. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting because it was like an active interoception task. Some of the tasks psychophysiological ones are more active in the sense of you're changing the state of the individual rather than asking the individual to monitor resting state. And typically you wouldn't monitor our resting state, we would monitor our change of state in order to monitor 
for example, changing the motion. And I just wondered if you could sort of speak to the potential for taking your terraceptive targets more often in this direction of looking at changing changing. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the great thing about that task that you just described is it allows us to kind of decouple the size of the signal from the perception of the signal. And there's certainly work being done looking at uh, cardiac and respiratory kind of manipulation using kind of infusions that um, sort of increase heart rate, for example, or increase respiration rate. The challenge with this is they're really invasive. So I have tried to uh, do an IAPS version of the the, uh, kind of an IAPS heart rate task, for example, and that hasn't worked very well because what we see is very, very minor changes. Um, and so it is kind of challenging to find something that we can use to kind of manipulate all of these signals um, in a way that isn't too uh, invasive. But yeah, I t totally take that point on board and I would say that I think a, a lot of us are moving towards trying to kind of be modulating and manipulating the signal. Um, but it's, a, it's somewhat easier said than done, and there are kind of practical limits to our ability to do that in different populations as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the front. Um, do you think that the interoceptive ability is trainable? Like, do you see uh, people improving in it across the course of a session? Um, think something like that. And, and if it were trainable, uh, do you think that you would then see, as people improve in interoception, you would then get an accompanying improvement in uh, emotional self-assessment or something like that? Yeah, so in terms of a session, uh, sessions are quite short, so typically we don't see that in, uh, individuals are improving over the course of a session, so it doesn't seem that practice alone seems to improve your interoceptive ability, so just doing the task over and over again isn't going to make you any better. But there certainly are researchers uh, looking at interoceptive feedback training, so presenting people with a tone or a beep or performance-based uh, feedback, for example. And that does seem to improve interoceptive ability when done over time. Um, so work from Sarah Garfinkel, for example, has recently shown that. And it does seem to be associated with improvements in uh, aspects of things like anxiety. Um, so it does seem that interoceptive training is possible. Um, I guess we don't know what the active ingredient is um, at the moment, so what, what aspect of uh, training is actually resulting in this pr improvement in anxiety or well-being, but it's certainly a way to uh, assess whether there is a causal relationship between, for example, interception and emotional ability, so it's useful in that regard that we can kind of modulate uh, individual differences in interception and see if we get the sort of changes that we expect. And it's also potentially useful as a therapeutic in the future if we actually learn more about what it's doing. <laughs> there was one over here. And I'll come to you next, Patrick. Uh, great talk. I just wanted to maybe put a bit of, or, or maybe it's work that's ongoing, but you kind of started with this question, of, like, why should we care about interception? And, and your answer was like, I guess a bit deflationary, maybe, compared to a lot of what's out there in the literature. I mean, you sort of suggest that there are, the evidence isn't as strong for these clear correlations to emotional processing or social cognitive processing mm. as maybe people have, have liked to think. And then that motivates your need for, for clearer and better measures. Mm -hmm. I guess I was wondering, like, have you, have you or anyone else got to when we feel like you've now used those measures to go back and Ah, oh, absolutely. So that's a good question. It's slightly giving me an existential crisis. <laughs> but, but no, yes, I think that really when I started my PhD, there were grand plans for testing these theoretical models and uh, what actually happened was a massive backtrack towards focus on measurement and I wouldn't say I've fully got out of measurement <laughs> yet um, I'm s certainly lurking there um, I might give a politician answer on whether I would say that the evidence based is good enough I would say that there are good theories most of these theories you know Almost every theory of emotion would ascribe this kind of fundamental role for the perception of physiological signals in emotional experience. But whether the way that we're testing these kind of relationships is good enough and it 
the kind of mixed results that we have been seeing in the literature, I would say that we, we kind of can't test these things properly until we have a kind of narrowed in on measurement and it might turn out that actually the evidence base that we have can be better understood by kind of complementary evidence from these newer measures or we may find that we need to change things I don't know what will happen in in the future but yeah I I would say that there are certainly some aspects that I would say I am not as convinced by because all of the evidence provided for relationships is from tasks that I would say um, are kind of fundamentally flawed. So yeah, <laughs> don't shoot me. <laughs> Thanks very much for a really excellent talk and I think you're absolutely right to start with measurement. I think uh, history will, will vindicate that decision. Um, quite a lot of what you were discussing was individual differences in perception and normally uh, when one studies individual differences in perception, one controls the stimulus, so at least the stimulus is the same for everybody. And then you are actually studying individual differences in the perception, not individual differences in the stimulus. Mm. Now, uh, you can't easily do that with your signals, as you uh, well described in response to the previous question, but I, I, I'm just a, a little bit worried about, for example, maybe interceptive accuracy reflects the strength of the, of the stimulus. Um, and it's not really anything to do with perception at all. Mm -hmm. So can you just help me to think about this as a psychophysicist who's interested in, on the one hand, describing the stimulus, and then additionally measuring how that stimulus is perceived. It seems to me I don't quite know what the stimulus is in your Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of a problem, at least with things like the heartbeat counting tasks, for example, and the fact that, you know, we we can't <laughs> always intervene to kind of manipulate the the, the size of the signal and, um, you know, the extent to which, you know, particularly for cardiac, uh, sort of individual differences is uh, kind of the cardiac output you have, your blood pressure, etc. It's very, very difficult to dissociate these. So as I was sort of saying in response to the other question, um, we are able to do that in some domains. So for example, there are domains that we can kind of um, make sure that everyone is getting the, the same stimulus. So for example, the taste perception study that I was uh, describing. But in other domains, that is very, very challenging to to achieve and certainly isn't something that can always be readily achieved and so I think that that's why it's useful to be looking at these domains of interception that are perhaps more controversial whether they are interceptive or not but which allow us to kind of manipulate the signal um, uh, strength in a way and control for this across participants when it's very challenging to do that in, in kind of other domains of interception, particularly cardiac. I mean, for some things you can use very invasive tasks um, to assess sort of uh, aspects of gastric perception, for example. Um, but yeah, for, for cardiac in particular, that one is, is slightly challenging. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that we've come to the end. Can we thank Jenny again for such a wonderful, engaging session? And 